sorry about the look. I, I don't mean the way I look. I just meant my clothes. I, I, I left London yesterday, and we had a weather warning, a heat warning. And it says, don't dress for the occasion, dress for the weather. So you've got to make sure you're casual and everything. And then I didn't realize that even the weather was limited to 20 in Wales. I, 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 don't, <laughs> I didn't realize you can't go over 20 in anything you do. So, uh, so I apologize. I'm not normally this casual uh, when I do something. I'm really glad Tim mentioned um, uh, the trust equation. The author of the trust equation is a hero of mine, David Meister. If you want a great book on trust, Trusted Advisor was his best-selling book. But I admire David Meister because he, he, he made a niche for himself. He became consultants to consultants. And I think that's the ultimate job, when you can consult to consultants, you know, kind of like the thief to the thieves. I, I, I like the idea of that role. Um, but part of this is about self-interest. I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. So I'm going to share some ideas, but I want to leave some time for you to ask any questions you might have. I have been to summer school before. I normally speak on the last day, which is a lot easier, because on Friday you'll be pretty much sitting on each other's knees, half inebriated from the night before, and, and you'll be joyful. Uh, it's harder on day one, but I encourage you to contribute in any way you want. I am French. I understand I have an accent. I apologize in advance, but if there's anything you don't understand or is unclear, then please just shout in Welsh or in English. I'll try to make sense of it. Uh, we've got the, the, the translation. So please do get involved. Do ask me questions at the end as well. We've got some time. Put anything you want on Slido. Um, because I want to talk to you about transformation. Obviously, you know, the great management thinker, Taylor Swift, was saying, if you experience turbulence, it probably means you're rising, which is a quote I absolutely love. Um, and, and I mean, she said many great things and she's helping our economy. I mean, just putting an image of her on screen is probably already raising the Lampeter economy by a few billions um, because that's what Taylor does. Um, but I think there is a point in this, which is that actually at any stage, the further up you go in an organization, the more senior you become, the more responsibility you want in life, the more turbulence you're going to experience. So it's something that is just there. The problem is that turbulence depends on when you're sitting on the plane. Now, I spent pre-COVID certainly more than post-COVID, but I spent quite a lot of my life flying about um, going to conferences and to meetings, and I'm not a good flyer. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy flying. And I know that when you are at the airport and the pilot uh, comes on before you take off and say, today our cruise is going to be taking place at about you know, 24,000 feet and we'll be cruising altitude, that's not so good. Uh, because 24,000 feet is roughly where the cloud cover is. And I think for me, that illustrates the workplace beautifully well. Because if you're a senior leader, this is what your flight looks like. It's really quite pretty. The clouds kind of look like little cotton wool. And you can see far ahead because you have vision. You're a senior leader. You have vision. Of course you do. So you've got an idea and everything looks beautiful. If you're on the ground, if you're in the workplace, if you're very junior, then it kind of doesn't look so bad. You're flying at 5,000 feet. You get a view of the city. You may like some of the streets or not, but it kind of looks all right. Your problem when you decide to rise in turbulence is that's your world and that's uncomfortable because you're kind of in the clouds, you're flying at 24,000 feet, you're being bounced around, and the people below you just don't understand why you've got so many issues, because, well, I can see the street. The people above think, look, I'm being really clear. It's just you. You can't have a drink at 24,000 feet because the plane is moving so much. So the point is, what are you going to do? What can you do to create clarity when there is none? What can you do to become comfortable and remove this fear of flying in turbulence that most people seem to have? And that's where I want to go today. And I want to start just by, there is a thing I hate, 
I'm going to share that with you. I hate it when people say, change is, change is faster than ever before. We live in changeable times like never before. That is just not true. My great-grandmother was born in the age of the horse. Okay? When she was born, people moved around in horses. By the time she died, age 98, in Dijon, France, it was the jet engine. We've gone from the jet engine to the search engine. I mean, I know that's quite a change, but it kind of doesn't feel like the horse to the jet engine. Change has always been there for every generation. Every generation thinks change is unprecedented because they're living through it. But there are things that just don't change. Human beings don't change that quickly. We still respond to pretty much the same stimuli as we did before. We still get engaged by pretty much the same things as we did. Sure, the context changes. The look of the street is going to change. But what is fundamentally driving us as human beings doesn't change that much. And that's worth remembering because actually, human psychology is still at a stage where it can't really cope with some of the developments that we're putting in, in its way. That's what's making it feel crazy. But what helps us is by knowing that we don't change that much, there is some stuff we can do as human beings to other human beings in order to make change copable with. And I want to share three with you. The three rules of flying in turbulence. And they're first, do no harm. That's kind of a good one. Second, shift perspective. Third, balance your board. I'm going to take you through all three, and then I'll open up, and you can ask any questions you want. And I'll try to answer them. I always say people who don't have imposter syndrome are people who don't have a French mother. Because, uh, you know, I was born in it, uh, you know. Uh, so I'm sure you have more answers than I do, which is why I would like to to have a conversation, and then you ask the question. I'm a consultant, so I'll say, what do you think? You'll give me the answer. I'll write about it, and I'll try to sell you the book. I mean, that's kind of my business model, fundamentally. That's how I work. So back in the plane, you arrive. So a few years ago, Catherine, my co-author, co-director, business partner, and wife, and I were working in Australia. So we were doing quite a lot of back and forth to Australia. Now, there's a terrible thing about me, which I'll also share, is I do smoke, uh, which is really hard when you travel to Australia because it's a long flight. So you picture the scene, 24 hours um, on the plane. You arrive at Heathrow. You want to get out as quickly as possible. This is what you see. Okay? So this is a typical image of Heathrow, you arrive, there's 20 desks, two people manning them, obviously. And the worst of it is there's five people behind, chatting, in uniform. So you have a choice at that stage. Okay? Your choice is you can go up and say, this is so typical. What are you doing, lazy, whatever? Depending on which country you've landed, having a go at the border official can either land you in jail or it can land you in trouble. It really depends. It's not something I would recommend. The other is just to take it in your stride. Now, these two are what we call the two R's. There's the little R, which is I'm going to react and there's the big R, which is I'm going to respond. A response is just a thought-through reaction. It's really, really hard to have a thought-through reaction when you want to escape this. It's really, really hard in the middle of turbulence to stop and have a thought-through reaction, which would be a response. Now, I have an advantage over you, is I have Catherine. So as we are moving down this queue, she says, don't do it. <laughs> don't start the argument again. Don't get the guy to put on the gloves and take you to the back room yet again like last time. You know you want to get out. Make it simple for yourself, and so on and so forth. And that's the rule. First, do no harm. First, respond. Do not react. Now, it doesn't have to take time. It doesn't have to take time, provided you've built the right context. But you have to move away from carrying this guy in your head. 
I hear this in every organization, in the private sector, in the public sector, in the third sector, it's like everybody is singing the same song. A little less conversation, a little more action, please. The old Elvis fallacy. Now, the problem with that is it just doesn't work that way. If you don't have a conversation, you're gonna get activity. You're gonna get people busy doing anything and everything because you just keep on at them saying, don't talk. If you want action, which is focused activity, then you're gonna have to, at some stage, have a conversation. Everything in organization, everything in life, starts and ends with a conversation. That's the bit that hasn't changed about human beings. We cannot make sense of the world without conversation. I have a son, his name is George. My children are called Charlotte and George. I've been trying to integrate for years. <laughs> Right? You can't get more regal than that. We even went to St. Andrews University. That's how regal we're trying to get in my family. Um, so George, when he was little, liked salt, but really liked salt. So George would just, if you didn't stop him, he would empty a salt pot on his food. Okay? Now, the beautiful thing with George is all I had to do was do this. I would go, George. And every time I went, George, he would stop and smile. It was fantastic. He would just, I didn't even have to say anything. I would go, George. And the problem is in business, you think you're managing Georges. You think that because you've said something and something happens, it's the right thing to do. Now, George was what in linguistic we call an indirect speech act. George was not reacting to the words I was saying. He was reacting to the meaning associated with the words. Now, what would happen is George would just suddenly realize that George meant stop whatever it is you're doing because he's getting annoyed. Okay? That, but why did he hear that? He heard that because for the first seven years of his life, which is roughly the age he was at, we grew up together. We made sense of the world together. We had enough conversation for him to understand that George stood for stop, whatever it is. Of course I could have had a conversation and had a long conversation and said, of course, George, you know, salt was an interesting condiment in high dosage. It's probably damaging to your health, given that you are fundamentally, as a young person, my pension. It is of my, in my interest for you to live for longer than me. It is therefore, I could have said all of this, but I didn't. I didn't because we knew each other. So a little less conversation, a little more action, please, is a, is, it doesn't work. You have to have the conversation. And the more conversation you are, the faster things are going to get. The more conversations you have, the less you're going to have to explain. The more conversation you have, the more things are going to happen. That's rule number one. So here is a trick. When you walk into, and for those of you who like reading, this is, or, or HR people, do we have HR people? HR people, this is called appreciative inquiry in the trade, plenty of books about it. It's worth thinking about the three Ds of having a different conversation. And the different conversations, instead of keeping on going to people and saying, what's broken, what can we fix? Start the other way around. Have a conversation with your teams around what's working, what's really good, what's really going well, now, there's two reasons for doing that. One is just surprising, because they go, hmm, that's never been asked before, because we tend to focus on problems. The other reason is because it reframes in our mind that our organizations are not problems. We spend so much time trying to fix issues that we see everything as an issue. So much broken. You know, I was saying earlier on, we were having a conversation, and I, this, there's elections going on in France right now. And I was saying to mom, we were discussing the election, and my mom said, well, you know, it's just crime, it's just crime. You know, it's, it's really worrying. These young people, you know, they don't stop for the police. I don't know if you follow French news, why would you? But there's been quite a lot of shooting of young people who don't stop for the police. And obviously, we have armed police in France, and, and some kids got shot. And mom, mom was talking and said, well, you know, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And I was thinking, well, I know of four, which is four too many, I grant you, but I know of four. And actually... Even if there was a child shot every day in France, that still only would be 365. 
which compared to the overall number of children in France is relatively small. But the problem is we talk about the stuff that's broken. We don't spend that much time appreciating the stuff that works. And if you don't, then actually in your mind, the stuff that's broken starts to take an overweight compared to its reality. So that's, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't do anything about the children that are being shot in front. I mean, you don't have to. I, I grant you, you, you have enough on your plate with the Welsh kids. <laughs> I think that's why they sent me to you, to be fair. I think I was thrown out of France to be sent here. Um, but the problem is, so, so we need to reframe ourselves. What is working? And the reason it's important is not just because it's nice, but it's also because if it's working, then what is it that you're doing that's making it work? Then you can start to dream about what would it be like if we were always like this. And if you have those conversations, then you're suddenly empowering people to have the conversation back with you around, we could do this, we could do that. You are effectively building your own Catherine who's going to get you out of trouble when you're about to be booked for insulting somebody in the custom office, which is kind of neat. Do you know this guy? New Amsterdam is a TV program. Now, I, I love that TV program because he goes around. He's, he's the CEO of, a, of a, a charitable hospital in New York called New Amsterdam. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not real. It's a film. No, I know, because when Dr. House, do you remember Dr. House? When Dr. House was on, you'd go to the US and they say, oh, you, you get treated by Dr. House. They thought it was real. This is not real. It's a film. But he's taking on this hospital, which has got loads of issues, loads of difficulties, and he goes around and effectively all he does, I mean, I'm, it's a bit, I'm giving it away here, but all he does is he just goes around and says, how can I help? Because he's decided he had absolutely no idea what he could do. He's just going around to people and saying, how can I help? Which, by the way, as a recipe for leadership, is just stunning. Because actually, you're suddenly asking people to, to, to help, you know, and, and you're saying, I'm here for you. But I want to flip it in turbulence. I want you to say to people, how can you help? Because, you see, people are full of ideas. People are full of thoughts. People are full of frustrations. People are full of dreams. People are full of ways in which you will solve the issues you have if you do it with them. I like the point about diversity being just not just a nice to have, but it just has to be there if you want to go anywhere. Because actually, even here, I'm pretty... I was going to say I could bet, but I don't want to talk about betting in, in a political times. Um, but I'm pretty sure, I would hazard a guess, that's the word I was looking for, I would hazard a guess that there are not many problems faced today in Wales that this room doesn't have the answer to. If we mine your brains, if we put your minds together, I'm pretty sure that you could solve, or at least attempt to solve, most of the issues that are currently in place in Wales. And I'm not saying that to be kind to you or to be nice to you, but just think about the figures we've seen on the Wales of experience. But it requires something, somebody, to say, how can you help? How can I create the conditions to get you to be free to explain, to explore, to dream, to discover? Because that's our role. You know, I, I was, again, saying this morning, I kind of gave up trying to change the world on a big scale, roughly in my 20s, I guess, or in my 30s. I realized that actually probably president of the world wasn't going to happen for me. It was my ambition as a child. I did practice my signature for the Global Peace Treaty until about the age of 11, and I had this really neat signature. I realized I was shooting a bit far, maybe, for my abilities, but there is one thing that we know. You can change the world one street at a time, and you can change your organization one team at a time, one person at a time, but it requires you turning around and saying, how can you help? How can I release your potential? And that's the bit that does no harm because it creates a response rather than always focusing on activity which just creates a reaction. That's my point number one. Point number two out of the three, shift perspective. There are three ways to look at any organization 
And I'm going to try to talk a little bit about AI, not that I'm one of those consultants that overnight decided that they were an AI expert because that's where everybody is buying. Uh, I have no particular expertise in AI, but I want to use AI as an example to what I'm going to talk about because I know you're going to talk about that some more. If you think about your organization, you can think about it in three ways. You can think about it in what I call in the business, in the organization. And that's really about understanding your job, doing the things that you have to do because you're contracted to do them. All of us have in the organization activities that we need to do. Even if you're a chief executive, there's still some stuff that only you can do, right? If you're in a public sector organization, that probably involves shareholder meetings or analyst meetings. If you're in a, uh, a public sector organization, there's some budgeting stuff, there's some planning stuff that you as the chief executive will be involved in. So everybody has in the business activities. Now, when we think about new things, change, AI, the default position is always to think about it as in the organization. How can it make my job easier? Okay, and we are very good at this. We are actually, by and large, pretty good at it. It's all about efficiency. It's all about how can I you know, do what I do quicker or do what I do slightly differently? How can it remove some of my pain? There is another way to look at it, though, which is what I call on the organization. So we are in the organization, on the organization. Now, on the organization is really where the big bucks come from. It's really where the payback of anything comes from because it's about you thinking, how does it help us be more effective? Not just efficient, but let's work on our organization. Can we change the processes? Can AI help us redesign the work we do? Not just make my work better, but change it completely and the link to you. And can we rethink the way we deliver services? Now, these start to be much more interesting questions than just, can it just help me deliver my stuff? It's about, can it do it differently in the business, on the business? But there's a third. And the third is out of the business. So these were the pictures, by the way, I should have said baseball, baseball coaching, American football, right? On the business, out of the business is a transition from completely different game. Have you thought about not even doing what you do? Why do you do what you do? Who else does what you do better than you do? So this is out of the organization. And I think that when it comes to turbulence, we are missing a trick. Fundamentally, most of us do it in the organization. We think about what does that mean for my role? What does that mean for the way I deliver? What does it mean for my job? We'll get more if we gravitate and think about it. What does it mean for the way we do what we do? But I think really the challenge, and especially the challenge, we've missed the COVID one. That was one challenge. We, we messed it up because COVID threw a lot of stuff in the way about how do we work? Why do we work? And we could have had some really big conversation about the world of work. We haven't had those conversations. I think we got some of the on the business stuff slightly changing. Yeah, you can work from home a bit. We still trust you. But there was a big conversation to be had around work. We haven't had it. I think AI is bringing a whole together larger conversation that is out of the business, which is why do we work? What is work? Who works? How is the... These are big conversations. They're social conversations, they're ethical conversations, they're philosophical conversations. Hey, they may even be political conversations. But all of those conversations, you cannot escape if you want to navigate change and if you want to live in turbulence. Because you know what? The pilot can just stand there and take it and... Do pilots still do that? I don't know, maybe just that. I have, I have no idea. I'm way out of my expertise. Um, but the pilot can pilot, right? Maybe they can call the tower or whomever they call to say, can we change our route somewhat because it's kind of bouncy? I hear American pilots do that. Did you know that? American pilots do it much more frequently than British pilots, apparently. American pilots are always, if you don't like flying in turbulence, go with an American airline. 
they don't take the pain so well. So the pilot very quickly says, this is really uncomfortable. Whereas British pilots, they go very British. They go, we're going through. We're doing this. So they don't actually shift. So, you know, but that would be on the business. So you can either take it or you change it somewhat. But there's a much bigger conversation, which is, do we need to fly? Why is the weather changing? Why is turbulence getting so bad? Why is Boeing still selling planes? I don't know, but there's a lot of conversations that need to happen, which have nothing to do with the way you work. But there are a lot to do with what value you deliver. And I think, if anything, if I've learned anything from having been to summer school before, I think that's your opportunity. It is one of the few places where you can have out of the organization conversations. And I know that you've been, you know, you've applied and you do all the stuff, and people around you at work, they say, oh, you're so lucky, you know, well done, you go into summer school, it's gonna be brilliant. Take your time. Think about yourself. Think about work result. And at about three this afternoon, they'll be on the phone or sending you emails saying, I know I said take your time, but this thing that I need, can you do this? You? you know, I know it's never as simple as that when you have a real job, but do start to think out of the organization. You can think on the organization, that's what most networking is about, but the real value, I think, is to think about how do we do things fundamentally differently. And you have got some real AI experts coming in to share some of their thoughts. You have got a lot of people coming in to share their thoughts, which hopefully will help you generate something which is different from just how do we do what we do better, but why do we even do it? So ask yourself, where is your time spent? Now, the higher up you go in an organization, if you think about it hierarchically, the more senior you become, the more time you should spend on the business and Normally, you probably would spend most of your time as a junior. You know, if you just joined an organization, you're learning the job, probably, you know, 70% of your time is spent doing your job. 10% of your time is trying to convince your boss that maybe there's a way of doing it better. And 10% of the time is thinking about, can I get another job? Uh, that's kind of roughly how it goes. Now, the more senior you become, the more this on the business becomes important the more time you're spending about how do we get better at what we do, not just my role, but actually, do we have the right processes? Do we collaborate? Do we have capacity? Do we have capability? Do we develop people well enough? All that stuff is on the business stuff. That probably will forever be the largest part of your job. I'm not saying be always out of the business, thinking great thoughts. That's fine, but that's not really your job unless you're a scientist who is getting paid to thinking great thoughts, in which case then that becomes in the business, think about something else as out. But think about those three dimensions. Where do you spend your time in a typical week? And try to think, is there a way? Am I happy with that? Should I rebalance it? Because again, this will help you cope with turbulence. Because sure, if you're spending all your time in the clouds, it's going to look bumpy. But if you raise your head every now and again and start thinking about, is there something I can learn, then you can get much more resilience in the system than there was before. And then, this is the balancing of the board. Got to get a cat in a presentation. I mean, you could probably tell I'm not a great gym person. I, I don't spend my life in the gym. But this is a, a balance board or a wobble board. It's called anybody ever seen a balance board or a wobble board? Basically, the idea is that you stand on it to balance your core. So you kind of stand on the board and, it, and, and you learn to balance and it helps you build your core. And it's very uncomfortable if you've ever been. Anybody been on a bubble board? No, you can raise your hand proudly. I mean, we'll still hate you. <laughs> we, we, you know, because they know, they know. They know it's not right. They know they're not normal. They go to the gym. That's not normal. So they go, oh, maybe me. Yeah, we know. Um, but you see, the wobble board is actually 
what turbulence and uncertainty feels like, but it's also the biggest leadership challenge of them all, which is you have different constituency that you look after. You have employees who want one thing. You have service users or customers or whatever you call them who want another thing. You have the people who give you your budget, be it the government or, or, or donors if you're in the third sector. They want something else. Then you have suppliers who want something else. And you're trying to manage and balance all of these people's priorities. Now, the problem is, often, they're opposite priorities. You know, service users want services now immediately at no cost whatsoever, and certainly no, you know, no money changing hand on my part or whatever, whatever, which actually the people funding the thing might not like so much. Uh, they'd rather some money came in and so on and so on. So you've got all these priorities. You've got my, my friend Fons Trumpenau, a, a Dutch gentleman. Um, Fons wrote a, a book called uh, Riding the Waves of Culture, which was his, his major uh, work. Um, and Fons says the world is full of ooh, ooh propositions. Ooh, ooh propositions, like little monkeys. Think of your leaders, picture them in your mind as little monkeys going ooh, ooh. And ooh, ooh stands for on the one hand, on the other hand, O-O-H, O-O-H. On the one hand, on the other hand. The world of work is all about on the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, I want this. On the other hand, I want that. The problem is that both hands are legitimate and right. And that we hate as human beings. We cannot cope with two things opposites that are both right. So when we see that, we do what most people hate, which is we compromise. And everybody hates a compromise, but it gets you out of the meeting quicker. You know, do you want one or 500? Well, I really want 500. No, I really want one. Tell you what, 250, because it's 6 o'clock. The kids need to be picked up from school. See you next week. And then next week, you have the same conversation. It's a bit like when Catherine and I got married. We, we wanted to go on honeymoon. And we said, OK, where should we go? Because Catherine and I do the same kind of job. We're lucky to have been to many places, traveled the world. We've been to a lot of similar places. And, and so we thought, well, it's a honeymoon. I mean, I'm French, so I don't expect to have more than five of them. So you know, the scope is limited in terms of, so I want to make it good. Um, so I, it's our honeymoon. So we said, well, OK, let's try to go somewhere we've never been, right? Because we've been to a lot of places, and, and we've never been to Japan. We have absolutely never been to Japan, never. And I thought, got to be done, surely. I mean, you know, do something. It'd be the first time we do it, both of us. First time together in a new place, discovering, walk hand in hand through the blossom. You know, the whole, uh, the whole thing in my mind. And then Catherine said, but you don't like fish. I said, I know, I know, but they have noodles I can cope. You know, we had this conversation, the whole thing. So Japan was an option. But then you think, what about if we don't like it when we get there? Like, this is the holiday, this is a honeymoon, right? You don't want to mess it up. It's not like, oh, well, better next year. You know, you, you, you. now New York, we know. And we, you know, we got engaged in New York. Catherine lived in New York. We know New York. We always stay in the same place. We always, the same. we love New York. Guaranteed 100% success in that holiday. Because we just know what we're doing. We're loving it. If you're an executive in business today, or in any organization, Japan, New York, you'll end up in Istanbul. You look at the map and you go, yeah, that'll do. Roughly in the middle. And, and you, you'll have hundreds of justifications for it, but you know it's not working for you. But it's better than the alternative, which is the conversation. Because actually to resolve that dilemma, this idea that you have two opposites and you need to make, you need to break that line. You need to stop seeing it as a continuum from New York to Japan. You need to see it as two positives, like on a two by two. And if you've been in any organization long enough, you know that a two by two, when you break the line, the right answer has got to be the top right hand corner. It always is with a two by two. It's not zero, 
which is what Istanbul would be, you want to say, how can I get the benefits of New York with the benefits of Japan all together? What's the holiday that's going to bring us that? Not the kind of Istanbul or not you go to one, then the other. You've obviously never traveled with Catherine. You don't travel economy with Catherine. You can't do both. We can't afford that. Uh, you know, so you've got to start thinking differently. And to think differently, you have to have conversation. It is all about relationships. And business people and organization people in general, business people in the private sector are the worst, but you in the public sector are quite good at it, at being terrible at conversations. Hopeless. Do you, do you go to Starbucks? I mean, this is not a Welsh insult. I'm not going, do you have Starbucks? <laughs> you have coffee? <laughs> this is not an insult. Um, but if you go to Starbucks, you will know that they will always ask for your name. Right? That's my cup. I call myself Tom. That's my Starbucks name. <laughs> because it's quite difficult to be called Emmanuel when you live in London and you go to Starbucks. Is that Manuel? No. Emmanuel. Is that with an I? No, that's German. Is that two L's? No, that's a film. You know, you get into so much trouble. <laughs> with the whole name thing, that it's so much easier to call yourself Tom. I always tell the, the, the story, in fact, in New York, Catherine and I had arrived in New York, and I was really, really jet-lagged. And Catherine said, oh, you know, would you go and get coffee? Because, you know, the hotel coffee, blah, blah. So I'm down in, in Starbucks in New York, completely jet-lagged. I've asked for two coffees. This barista is doing her best. She's standing, she goes, Coffee, that's my American accent. Coffee for Tom. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> I should just maybe just adopt that one. Coffee for Tom. And I'd forgotten. <laughs> so, so we're all standing there going, oh, God, come on, where is Tom? You know. Then I remembered. So I went, oh, that's me. And then the whole queue is looking, the guy's just remembered his name. <laughs> Give him triple shot, triple shot. <laughs> So be careful, make sure you recall. But you know why this happened. This happened because at some stage, senior leadership team at Starbucks headquarters said, we need to reconnect with our customers. We need to be like cheers. I can't do the American accent. We need to be like cheers, you know, where everybody knows your name. And we need them to come and it would be like the Italian coffee experience. You know, the whole thing. You could see that management meeting getting really excited. You know, they were, they were in the visionary stage. Yeah. Like when Howard set up the company, you could see it. You can smell it like the coffee. Four layers of management later, it became this aberration. Collect the name, write it on the cup. For every 50 names collective, bonus, free muffin, or whatever it is. There's some incentive thing. This is the problem that we have in most of our institutions. We are trying to make the big feel small. We have a fundamental issue between efficiency and intimacy. And when we're trying to build intimacy, we try to throw efficiency tools to build it, and it doesn't work. Have you ever been here? See, my friend. Well, it's not my friend, it's my friend's wife. So I shared a dorm with Matthew, whose wife sat abroad when I was at Atlantic College. I'm a big fan. But you can imagine one shops, two shops, three shops, and you go there, and you're known because it's your local one, and they do the pastries, and they'll chat to you, and you get to know them. And eventually, you know, wish them well, 2,000, 2 billion, 2 million shops, and you become that. You think, well, I can't be everywhere, I can't know everybody, so we're gonna set up some procedures, we're gonna set up some rules, we're gonna set up some ways. And you get an issue, which is actually you start to forget what you're doing this for. See, organizations are really two things. You can, part of it is the organization, hence the name, it's organized. Right? And that's why you have your organization, because you can't have a meeting every time you need something to be done. So you have roles, and you have rules, 
and you have economic incentives. That's how organizations are designed. You, you do this, you do it that way, I'll pay you. You don't, I won't. That's kind of how an organization is set. But that's not how an organization works. The way an organization works is through what I call the company. And I like the word company because company comes from the Latin root breaking bread together. Organizations work when a bunch of people are just trying to make sense of it. You know, just like in your world line of work, whatever it is, when you pick up the phone and say, now I know this doesn't quite fit, the, but you know, if we could do this like this or like that, or if we could move that one quicker or prioritize, you try to make sense of the world. Now, for that to work, for these relationships to work, you need something else. You can't rely on roles, rules, and economic incentive. You have to rely on the individual, this idea of reciprocity. You do something for me, I do something for you, it makes sense, I have a relationship. With, and you rely on this kind of social and moral obligation. I do it because it feels right, not because I'm paid for it. Now, the two worlds need each other, but don't work together that well. I'll give you an example. My daughter is called Charlotte. And Charlotte... She was about eight, she's 26, she hates me telling the story. She said, you make me sound so stupid. Um, but it's a true story. She was eight. So when she was eight, she said, Papa, the only friend she knows. You think my accent is bad, you should hear. She's from Essex and she lives in Doncaster. Picture that in your ear and let it hurt. So I says, Papa, Pops, I need pocket money. Not I want, oh, no, no, she needs pocket money. She's eight, she needs pocket money. Do you have children? If you do, you, but you're normal parents. So normal parents, you have a choice. You can say yes or you can say no. I'm not a normal parent. I'm a leadership development professional. I am part of the HR community. If my daughter says, Papa, I want pocket money, I think, ooh, this is a learning opportunity, a teaching moment. And because I'm part of the HR community, I have flip chart at home. Because <laughs> we all do. It's how we live. So this is a true story. If you came to my home, you would have gone to the kitchen, you would have gone to the fridge, and on the fridge, fridge was a flip chart. And the flip chart said this, for brushing your hair every day, I will give you 10 pence, because she has long hair. For Tidying your bedroom every day, I will give you 10 pence, because she's messy. For doing your homework every day, I will give you 40 pence, because I'm French. Education more important than hygiene. You have to teach the cultural <laughs> values, each to their own. For not shouting at your brother, this is a stretch target. I'll give you a pound, but that's impossible. I know it's stretch target. That's the point. You're not supposed to get it, or it wasn't stretched enough. So we have all these conversations. And Sunday is payday. Saturday, we're sitting at home. I'm saying, Lulu, I call her Lulu. I said, Lulu, you haven't tidied the bedroom. You've done very well. You've almost got everything. But you haven't tidied it. Well, how about, I'm trying to sound excited. How about you go upstairs, you tidy the bedroom, and then I'll come and check it, and then it'll be beautiful, and you get 15 minutes go by, not a sound in the house. Now, if you have more than one child and there's no noise in your house for 15 minutes, you know something's going on and it's not what you'd planned. So I go upstairs, I open the room. It's still a complete tip. It is a mess beyond belief. And Charlotte is lying on her bed, painting her nails with the Barbie varnish. Essex, painting her nails with the Barbie varnish. So I said, Lulu, we had a deal. You were going to come up, you were going to tidy, la, 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 la. And she turns back, looks back at me with the most beautiful eyes in the world and said, Papa, I've been thinking. Ten pence? Not really worth it, is it? <laughs> she's now unionized with her brother. How French is that? But what's the point? The point is not that. Of course, that's an organization. That's how organizations work. You have to make the price commensurate with the perceived amount of effort. That's an organization. But my problem wasn't that, because she understood how organizations work. That's a lesson. My problem was the following weekend, because the following weekend was all about Lulu, G, I call my boy G, Lulu, G, come down, we're going to see Grandma and Grandpa. 
Charlotte came down at the speed of light. She went straight to the kitchen, straight to the flip chart. She looked at it five times. She turned around and said, Pops, how much is it for grandma and grandpa? Because it's not on the flip chart. <laughs> and that's your issue. That's the issue. The issue is the more you gravitate towards that world with tools of organization, the more you're destroying this. Because the more we talk about our organization, the less we get of our company. And we know that. I mean, the, the studies have been replicated from years, for years and years and years. We need to reconnect to what makes us human. And think about relationships. Relationships require reciprocity. It's not just about, I need you. It's about you turning around saying, yes, and I need you too. If you follow somebody in the street, when, they have, when they're not keen on you following them, that's not a relationship. It's called stalking, and it's illegal. Well, in organization, it's perfectly legal. We are constantly stalking people in, relation, in, in organizations. We're going, I need this from you, I need that from you, I need this from you, without ever thinking about, do you need anything back? That can't be right, and it can't lead to a productive relationship. So we need to be able to somehow reconnect to this company, and this is the solution to all your problems. Wells is such a hard... See, you do this in England, even in Scotland, and they're weird, but you do this in England, and people, ah, oh, you just have to show the picture. You don't even have to... They go, oh, how cold-hearted are you people? <laughs> no wonder you've got to impose speed limits. I tell you what, though, I don't know what the big deal is about the 20 miles. If I lived in this country, I'd like to run through it at 20 miles. It's beautiful. You know what I mean? You're driving, you can actually see something. I mean, I don't mind the M4, make it 100, but I mean, when you get here, 20 is okay. So this is a panda, just in case you've never seen one, given your reaction. <laughs> God, what kind of people are these? Last time, they loved it. I love the panda. And, and I love the panda because the panda is the best example of purpose that I have ever seen in my life. And for a simple reason. Any biologists here? I'm just saying that in case there are any. I'm simplifying, okay? I'm just saying. Panda. Carnivore. Halfway through its evolution, decides to go vegetarian. Not only that, chooses the only food that it can't digest properly and refusing to reproduce. Nature has been trying to get rid of the panda for millennium. That thing has no right to exist, okay? That thing is just a natural disaster. But every time you see one, you go, oh, I have a fiver. And it works every time. The WWF do not explain what they do anymore. You've no idea what they do. They just show you a panda, put a sticker with one on it, and you go, oh, I have a fiver. That, to me, is purpose at its best. Because purpose is not something you should have to explain or put on a poster or whatever. It's something that people should just get. And because they get it, they give you that discretionary effort. Not the stuff that you've contracted them to do, but the stuff that you really need from them, which is the rest of their brain and their passion and their creativity and their challenge and their ideas. All of that you can't pay. Otherwise, you're just going to get Charlotte on a flip chart. What you want is you want to try to get back into this sense of what are we here for? I had to teach my own daughter that grandparents were not just a sound investment. Okay, that you aren't just doing it because they'll die and you'll get the cash. They're from Yorkshire. They don't have any. Don't worry about it. There has to be something else. And that's what we do in organization, but that's where we need to reconnect to our purpose. And the panda helps us because the panda is really just a narrative. And the narrative is this, and I'd love it if this week just take some time to think, actually, who am I? What's my story? Anybody seen this film? I've, never seen, I've, I've used this slide for a long time. I've never seen the film. Um, but I like it because it's called Fighting. And here it says, Some dreams are worth the fight. 
Now, this is my uh, American accented deep voice. Neither things I have. Some dreams are worth the fight. If you see this poster and you read the tagline, do you know the film? Do you know whether that's a movie you want to go and see or not? I'm pretty sure you do, right? Young guy, Midwest of the US, probably quite poor, might even work on the farm or something, but he's got his fist, thinks that's how I'm going to make it, I'm going to fight my way to the top, because he's kind of called fighting, that's a clue. I'm going to fight my way to the top, then at some stage, somebody's he's going to find somebody he fancies, but she or she, he or she's not going to fancy him back. Um, going to go with a jerk, because they always do, until about 20 minutes in when they realize the error of their way and kind of come. It's like Rocky with a better looking guy. I mean, that's my guess, all right? And I haven't seen the film. But you know, you know that it's not the, you know, you can make a decision. You don't have to see the film. Now, the problem with purpose in organization is we try to play the film in order for people to make a decision. You know, we say, well, okay, you know, we're going to talk to you about our new strategy or our new purpose or whatever. So we've got a, a PowerPoint that we've thought through. We even have a Q&A document because we've thought about your questions in advance and provided the only answers we have. Actually, these are the only questions we can provide answers to, so please don't ask any. Um, you know, you do the whole thing and you're showing them the film. And it's a bit like if you go and see a movie like Sleepless in Seattle, but just for the last three minutes, and you walk in a room of 100 people in the movie theater going, oh, and you're going, what, what's going on here? And they say, oh, well, it's, it's you know, two people kissing or something. And you go, yeah, well, what's the deal? <laughs> I've tried it myself. You know, you can't explain a purpose. You've got to live through it. You've got to involve people in it. They have to make the decision as to whether they want to see the film. So the thing I want you to do this week is think about who are you? You, individually, not, not you as a... Who are you? Oh, that's me. Sorry, that's you. See? Hey, tailoring your slides. Boom! <laughs> I know how to get the big bucks. <laughs> Uh, who are you? Inclusive. <laughs> I used to have the EU one, got rid of that one. Not politically correct anymore. Good joke, though, for the two years afterwards. After that, it started to be a bit hurtful. <laughs> Where are you going? Who are you? Where are you going? Where are you going? What's life about? What are you trying to do? The only thing that will save us in this world is if you never become cynical and never stop being curious. So where are you going? What are you trying to do? What's your hope? What's your dream? And really, why are we going there? What's the point of it all? Why that destination? Why not another? In a way, what I'm asking you to do is to answer that fundamental leadership question. What's your panda? What's your panda? What is it that you're going to say to me which is just going to make me get it and go, oh yeah, have my effort? It doesn't fit on a poster. It's not a thousand word story. It's not anything other than just you. And I was asked this morning about leadership development. And Rob Goffey at the London Business School wrote a, a magnificent book called Why Should Anyone Be Led By You, which I also really like. But Rob has a, has a view that I share about leadership development. And he says, leadership development is really about be yourself more with skill. It's OK to be you. It's fine to be you. Don't fall for the authenticity trap, which is used by bully to justify their bad behavior by saying, well, I'm just being myself. Yeah, but you're a jerk, so please hold it back. You know, I don't, I, but just be the best version of you that is possible and give it out. Explain to people who you are. 
because they're crying out for leadership, for people to share with them. And this is important because it helps you manage your board. It helps you to go to your stakeholders without being afraid, without breaking anything and saying, help me. Help me to reconcile the things that are making this so uncertain. How are, gonna we, how are we gonna work through the dilemmas that we face? You might not be able to solve them, but you're gonna have much better conversation when we say, how do we get the best of what you want with the best of what you want? Not some kind of weird compromise, but how do we make it come together? And actually, you know, that's the role of government, and I don't mean politicians, I mean of government, which is constantly, and I don't like the idea of balance as in, you know, half-half, but just balancing those priorities that everybody has, but trying to reconcile them in something greater than nobody gets anything they want. Because they are interesting solutions. So these are your, your three, and I'm gonna leave you with a um, couple of thoughts. The first is, I think AI is one of those opportunities we have to have a different conversation. And you have two choices that face you. One is to just jump on the bandwagon. That's a bandwagon. I was so dead chuffed with that one. Wait till the next one, though. <laughs> the next one is art. I want the IP office to do something about that next one. I think we need to. You can jump on the bandwagon and it will just make you more effective and efficient. There's no doubt about it. You can do your job better. I think the big ticket item though is, how does it help us ride better? How cool is that, people? <laughs> you can't be, you just say to Chad GPT, literally, put me a dragon on a plane. Bam! I mean, if that doesn't sell AI to you, nothing else will you can get a dragon on a plane. But the point is that you can actually seize that opportunity. And it's really just down to you as to whether you're gonna be in the plane suffering from turbulence or whether you're gonna jump on it and say, actually, you know what, I'll ride that thing. I'll ride it. Because nobody else will. Nobody else will. I'll leave you with this, 14,600, just a number. Um, I've done it at every conference I've always spoken at. I, I apologize if you've seen it before, 14,600. Uh, I don't know if you think it's a big number or a small number, but it is roughly the number of days you have left to live, which if you put it like that, it's not that many. And if I look in the room, average, I've been generous. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, don't want to insult you, just want to give you feedback. Apart from the three at the back who go to the gym, you have a couple more. But was it worth it? Mm, don't know. For all that pain, uh, you're getting a couple more. Now, I'm telling you this because we did some, uh, Catherine and I, back in 2003. Now, this is only U.S. data, so I apologize in advance. Uh, but in 2003, we did a study in the U.S., uh, it sounds like a game show, which is always the best studies. We went to 1,000 people over the age of um, 65, and we asked them, what are the three things you would do differently? What are the three things you regret? What are the th three things you would change? Here are the three most common answers. I would take time to stop and ask the big questions. I would be more courageous and take more risks in work and love. And I would try to live with purpose, make a difference. Not a big one. Not signing a peace treaty for the world, maybe just a difference in your street but, or in your family or whatever, but I would try to do that. These were the three. Now, the only difference between these people and you is I've just told you. So you get a chance to do something about it. Because you know what? Actually, of all the audiences I speak to, which is why I am always honored to come here for two reasons. The first is I owe you a lot, Wales because Wales changed my life, literally. Um, I would not have the life I have without Wales, and I wouldn't have had it without people doing the stuff you do. Um, so, out of all the audiences I speak to, that third one, I would try to live with purpose, make a difference. You have it, because you do it as part of your job, it's a whole lot easier to make a difference when you're you than when you make washing powder for a liquid or light bulbs.
You know, you can have some weird purpose about we're going to shine the light through the world by making light bulbs or make the world cleaner and whiter. It ain't quite the same by way of purpose as what you do. But you know what? Tomorrow, however hard we try to mess it up, the planet still turns every day. And tomorrow, pretty much the same with one difference. One less, and you've just spent about an hour of it with me. Um, I'm going to stop up enough for questions. Just so you know, that's my email at the top. I will never try to sell you anything. I will never try to waste your time. I will never contact you. If you want to contact me, I will always answer. So if you have anything that you didn't want to share here, that you think, oh, hang on, I didn't quite understand, or I have a very specific question, didn't want to share, whatever, please, please, please do email me. It matters to me a lot because I owe you, okay? I owe you so much. I want to give back as much as I can, so please feel free. And like I said, this is not a sell ploy. I'm not going to try to say. Um, so that's where you can find me. Don't Google Emmanuel. That's one bit of advice I learned early on. <laughs> Uh, not when you have an IT department with all sorts of filters, you get in trouble. Um, if you find it easier, that second address will take you to the same address. I have a little podcast which we've been playing with the whole of this year where we just take a random work from the dictionary and try to build a leadership lesson on it. You can find that as well if you want. Just a bit of fun, but thank you. You there? Yeah, let's go over These are not my kids, by the way, just so you know. These are far too pretty to be mine. I should put a picture of mine as well. You think, oh, dear. <laughs> right. Emmanuel, thank you. That was fantastic. Really uh, appreciate that. We've got probably oh, 15 minutes or so for questions. Happy to take some from the floor, but you can also use Slido, I believe, to post some questions as well. We can pick them up, up here. Oh, yeah, there. Oh, there we are. See? Oh. There we are. Um, so. Should we start with the one about going back a little bit to the connection we have a little bit with Atlantic College? So uh, how did you come to go to Atlantic College and what about it changed your life? Oh, I, it's very simple. I, um, so my dad was a train driver. My mum was a, a, effectively a domestic servant. Uh, we then worked in a shop and I was at a, we grew up on a, we, don't, we didn't have council estate per se. It was a railway estate. So it was owned by the railway, but equivalent to a council estate. And, and I had a, I messed about, I, I, was, I was a clown, um, and at some stage, the school said, we're going to hold him back a year, he's not mature enough to go forward. And that changed my life in one way, which is that the next year, when I went up to school, uh, we had an experimental class. It happens a lot in France. The French education system is always experimenting one thing or another, and I was in an experimental class, and the experimental class um, was all about collaboration, blah, blah, blah. Cut a long story short, it had some amazing teachers who were all connected to different parts of the world. And there was one teacher there who one day said, well, you know, there is this movement of schools. And, and I was, you know, 15, and it was all about we're going to make the world a better place and blah, 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 blah. And it's free because it's scholarship driven. You just have to be selected. So I apply. I went to Paris because we didn't pay the train because my dad was a train driver, so I could go to Paris. I went to Paris for the interview, and there were so many places, and I got one. And so I arrived here. I couldn't speak any English because I spoke German. That was my foreign language. My granddad used to say, you know, it could come handy just in case. Um, so so we, did, we, did, we did German, not English so much because you guys come at the back end to sort it out. Um, so that was that, and, and it changed my life because it took me out of a, a life where I was going to end up probably in the railway. Um, this is one fasc sorry, fascinating thing about France. So if your parent works for the railway, you get extra point at the entry exam. So I had 10 automatic points at the entry exam because my dad was a train driver, and it's the, the inner belief is it must be in the DNA. So I was given 10 extra points, which is probably where I would have ended up. So it did change my life. OK, great. Um, we'll come up with the first question. I'm happy to take some from the audience as well. If you want to, then put your hand up. We'll take one more from the, uh, 
uh, the, the slider first, though. Uh, one I'm really interested in, in terms of what you're going to say, is, is the, the first one we've got there, because I'm probably classed as a leader who might be above the clouds. So it's leaders in or above the clouds are so ingrained in the perceived safety of organisations, how can we shift them to be more passionate about the company? I, I would... Um... I take issue with the premise, actually. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um, I think the problem is, is it's, it's all about flow of information. You know, I was, I'm often asked about uncertainty, and, and I hear senior leaders, ah, they just don't get it. They just don't get it. They just don't get it. But they can't get it because they just don't have the same information. You know, in the same way that in, in this country, you say, oh, the king thinks that the country smells of fresh paint because everywhere he goes, they've just repainted the buildings. And it's kind of the same. I mean, sorry to say, but it's kind of the same for senior leaders. You know, I see that a lot when you go on to a departmental visit or something. I mean, of course, they're not going to show you the cracks on the beds and go, oh, we really messed up last week. You should have seen. It's hilarious. We lost about four million. You know, no, I mean, everything is going to be, and, and they don't want to waste your time. So it's not always out of wanting to lie, but it's also a, a kind of sense of deference. So it's really it's really hard for senior leaders to know the truth, and it's really hard for people at the bottom of the organization to kind of want to voice it because there's some fear in the system about, well, I need this job or whatever. So I, I think the problem is we've got people who see the world differently and find it really, really hard to communicate. And I think you are custodians of the truth because you know what's really going on. I always say, you know, you have more value in you than you know because you know what things are really like and that's something that lead, senior leaders don't know now part of the issue is we don't know how to articulate it in a senior language leader uh, a senior leader language so there's a number of things here first of all in most organizations the language is finance and that's not something we tend to enjoy talking about um, the other thing is about strategy or plan or delivery so if you can articulate the truth in a language which other people understand, whether you're senior or, or not, then actually you have a chance to meet. I genuinely think people at senior level understand the power of connections. I, I really do. In fact, we were talking about it this morning when you were saying, you know, about how do you make different places work together and so on. So I don't think it's a rejection necessarily of the company. I think they are quite passionate about results, but it's just about the language that we use to understand each other. No, thank you. Uh, and I think, go back to something you said, it's probably the answer to some of these questions in this room, collectively. You know, I think the question I'd also have back is, what would you like to see from your senior leaders as well? You know, because we have different perspectives, we look at things different, you know, so actually what would work for you? Um, I think it would be something that would be really good to, to get some, some thoughts on at some point. Have we got anyone in the room who would like to raise a question? Because we have some roving mics, so one at, one at the back. Oh, can we turn the mic on to get the... Don't touch the button! You were warned! Keep talking, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, would your daughter support the French team in the Euros? Or the, no. Um, very seriously, um, on relationships, we... We, um, are, I note, scepticism in this trying to build relationships when you're asking to, I'll give you a bit, I'll give you a bit. Have you got any tips for how to overcome the sceptics in our organisation who want to have relationships with you but feel like you're coming for them for a non-reciprocal arrangement? So it's that thing, and how do you build genuine relationships where you're asking for something to start with? Okay. So... My kids support whichever team is winning. That's what I've learned very early on. They just don't care. They have no allegiance to anything unless it wins. So, so they'll be French or English, they'll split, whatever. Um, I think it comes back to the first question I put on screen on this New Amsterdam thing. You can't start a relationship by saying, I won this. You know, it's like a bad dating show. You know, you, you, you go to that first date show or whatever, when you see those people walking in, you pretty much know where it's going to go by the first thing one of them says, which is if they only speak about themselves and what they need, you think that's not going to go very far. So I think part of the issue is about how can you help? You know, how can I help you? What can I do for you? And just connect people to show them the power of relationship. So, for example, I was working with a, uh, a gentleman years ago 
who spent about a whole month just putting people in touch with each other and then carried on doing it. And he never asked for anything in return. But you know, I mean, you know, after this week, when you go back, you say, you know what? I hear you've been struggling with this issue. When I met this person at summer school, they had exactly the same issue. I know they don't work here and they work somewhere else. And put them in touch with each other. And if you do that enough times, then people will do the same for you. I mean, you know, you have, it's kind of like um, if people, you know, sometimes I, I get, oh, can you do a motivational speech? You can't motivate anybody. It's meaningless. It's a stupid thing to ask. People motivate themselves, you know, and start the trend anyway. If you're not motivated, you're not going to motivate anybody. So it's all that thing about, you know, if you start it and show the value of it. Because um, it comes back to that question about, about, there was a question here about process versus outcome. The reason people focus on process over outcomes is because they see process as the issue to be fixed. An outcome will take care of itself. It's, the discussion has been had before about which process is going to give us the outcome. The, if the outcome is not coming, we'll carry on working on the process. So again, it's about understanding where the value is. And if you say to people, well, let's kind of try to increase the value, then they'll happily go to process or they'll go to relationship or they'll go to anything else. But you have to understand what makes people tick in terms of what they get from it. There's a really interesting question here. It says, if Elvis is a fallacy, how do we ensure conversations uh, turn to meaningful actions, not just cycle around conversations? And it links to something I was thinking in terms of, we've all yeah. been in meetings that go around, there's lots of talk, yeah. but actually the difference between that and you know, good conversations that turn into action. And that's about your ability. It's about your ability to frame that conversation and to moderate that conversation and to lead that conversation. That doesn't mean that, you know, this is back to on and in, in the organization, on the organization. Are you in the conversation or on the conversation? If you, and you've got to work at both levels. So you've got to be in the conversation, this, you know, injecting ideas, listening, whatever. And then at the same time, you've got to think about, is this going anywhere? Why is this person silent? Why is, does there seem to be some unspoken stuff? And you've got to kind of manage the conversation and be able to input. And then eventually kind of say, is this of any use? What are we getting? Back to the value point. So I'm not saying just have a chat, which is why, and by the way, I'm never going to say you don't need the organization. Of course you need the organization. Without the organization, you're just organizing a party. I mean, you just end less discussion, and less conversation. So you need that. But your job is to make the link between the two, to say, how is this conversation improving our organization and the delivery of services or whatever it is that you do? So I'm not saying just have a chat. I'm saying you have to be managing and leading that conversation too. Great, thank you. Okay, anyone else in the room like to ask a question? What? Brilliant. One at the front. And what I would say is, might be nice given it's day one. I know all the things on the slide have got anonymous around them. I don't know if you can put your name in. It'd be really nice if you can. But also, actually, if you then just maybe introduce yourself as well as a good starter for the week. So, over to you. Okay, fine. I'm um, P. I work at Betsy Cadwallader. Um, I love the plane and the turbulence analogy. I guess my question is, the more senior we get, we have a seat on two planes. And back to your balancing the board and causing no harm. How do I have one foot on the plane that's above the clouds and speak in that language whilst maintaining one foot on the plane that is climbing and falling and, and doing the turbulence? So if you contact me, actually, I might just send it to Debbie and then you can see, I don't know if you've got like a web space where you store document. I can share an article with you. So Catherine and I thought a lot about this, um, actually, when we were doing some of that work in Australia, and we wrote about it in, in our book, Unleash Your Leader. But um, you can't. What you need is what we call high-low agility. You need to be able to go up and down quickly. You can't be in both. Um, but you, your job is translation. You know, I, I don't know if you read science fiction. I, I, I fell in love with Asimov when I started to be able to read in English and, um, and in the foundation. And so, but Asimov had a view uh, that there would be a job one day which would be just scientific translator. 
and it would be the person who can make sense, who can, who can make technology make sense for the rest of us. And I think he wasn't far wrong. Um, but I think that's kind of your job, which is value translator. And, and that agility is about how can you translate the pain, the excitement that is felt into value for senior leadership and translate the need for value into the excitement. Because, you know, I mean, I, we went through that. I, there is an organization I do some work with, which I think is a stunning organization in the, in the healthcare sector, not in the UK. But it, it's, it's a private organization operating in the healthcare sector. So there's a huge dissonance in terms of value, because you've got people saying, but how can they be for profit or whatever, whatever, you know, and, and most of the people who work there, generally their purpose is to make life better, you know, and they go, yeah, but you're asking for our shareholders or whatever. And can you imagine that translation job that the CEO has to do all the time to say, yeah, but hang on, <laughs> nobody's going to invest in that. And, and, you know, we're saving the health system. Blah, 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 blah. So y you've got a lot of work to do. Now, you may or may not believe in that work, but at least you can make a call then to say, well, I want to work for that organization or not, because somebody has translated the value. Um, but I think that's your job to say, okay, how do I take that, translating it for our senior leaders? How can I translate that for the, and, and just go up and down quickly, because you can't sit comfortably between the two, because you'll do the splits or something, I don't know. But, but that's kind of, you know, this, that turbulence thing. So above the cloud, under, above, under, under, whatever and avoid the middle bit. Great. Do you have a question? No? OK. I'll t take one more then from the, the uh, slide back here. Maybe to finish on this is, what's your panda? So I always say I got into this job for the same reason an oyster makes a pearl, out of sheer irritation. <laughs> I, I was annoyed at what I saw in every organization. And I decided quite early on that there had to be a better way. So everything we've done with the team, everything that I do is always driven by, there has to be a better way and together we can find it. Not me, I don't have any, I'm no brighter than you are. I know the only difference between me and you is I don't have a job. You know, so when Charlotte was at school, they, they had a parents, we went to a parents' evening, and the, the teacher said, oh, Mr. Gobby, I'm, or oh, Gobbelot, um, I'm, very, I'm very sorry you lost your job. And I thought, ooh, hang on a minute. I've, I'm employing myself, and I haven't fired myself, so I don't know what's going on here. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, oh, well, we were having a parents' day where the children had to explain what their parents do. And Charlotte said, oh, well, my dad sits at home, watches the telly, reads the book. And I was thinking, that's research. That's not an employment, surely. Um, so I don't have a proper job. So I get to spend my time researching, writing, or whatever. So, but my view was always, you have the answer. I can just try to have the questions and facilitate. So that's why I wanted to get in that job. So my panda for me is just that. It's, you know, there has to be a better way. We can't carry on this way. It's just silly for everybody involved. But together we can find it. Nobody can impose it because it wouldn't work that way. Brilliant. I think our time is up, so thank you very much indeed. I'm sure hopefully over this week we'll find a better way of doing some things collectively. Thank you. So thank you very much for your time, Emmanuel. Oh, thank you. Please, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.